This film is essentially about two families, connecting, listening, speaking, asking questions and sharing stories. It's a yarn, a collaboration between our family and an Aboriginal family living on the central coast of New South Wales. Wiradjuri woman Jen Ridley and her partner Uncle Charles Davison, a Gadigal elder. And we're speaking from Jarrah People's Country here in um, central Victoria. And we originally um, reached out to Jen and Charles because we were writing a, uh, an article on families who are choosing to educate their kids outside of the conventional schooling system and uh, specifically for cultural reasons as well as social and environmental reasons and of course meaning reasons as well. So we wanted uh, to speak to them about their experiences, what they're doing as educators and uh, as parents and grandparents and as community uh, actors and leaders. Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander viewers, please be aware that this film may contain culturally sensitive material, including images, voices and names of people who have died. The view from the shore. Truth telling, resilience, language, health and family education. Well, just as a background, we have 10 children and we have also have adopted children. The age of the children is in the early 40s down to nine of our children. Um, so first and foremost, I think education as a mainstream institution has changed dramatically in that time frame. In New South Wales, I think the mainstream education system for speaking exclusively for Aboriginal children was better 20, 30 to 20 years ago than what it is now. Mm. Now it is so conformed and so adhered and geared to COAG and to closing the gap, which transparently we think is absolute load of BS and so you've got all of those outcomes based things which don't take into consideration any real meaningful conversations that connect families communities with the space that's an instituted space mm -hmm. so both Charles and I worked I was a teacher I was a Steiner teacher and Charles was he, he um, was the state president in New South Wales for what's called the AECG and that's the Aboriginal Education Consultative Group of which there is one in mm. Victoria um, and for a long time he was the state president. Mm. He moved to health to try and see if health would be, you know, as accepting as what education was. In that era, Labor government was in in New South Wales mm. and we've had very conservative um, state government ever since and if you also connect that to the federal funding for anything to do with Aboriginal it's become more and more conformed and conservative uh, in the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. Our particular situations we've had our children in various we've, we've lived in a few locations um, and that, in a way that dictated our choices, um, living on in Bellingen, um, there, that's where I was part of the Steiner School there. Um, it, it was it was a dream, mm -hmm. and so 25 years ago, as as a Steiner teacher, I actually had an all Aboriginal class of teenagers, um, completely fee free, funded by the local community. So I enrolled them through Bellingen High School and had them at the Steiner School. Mm. So that, that now doesn't happen in any Steiner School in, in, that I know of. Mm. Um, we did continue when we moved to Sydney in Steiner Education, um, initially at what's known as the first uh, Steiner School in Australia. And um, 
completely coin flipping because they had never had, a Sydney Steiner school had never had an Aboriginal student in the school, mm -hmm. uh, in the, the, the three main Steiner, the three Steiner schools in Sydney. Putting our children in to the one we selected initially was a good experience and we were heard as, as Aboriginal parents and as parents who had did bring quite a laden basket of goodies to their space to be able to share with them. The next school was similar where, because it was a cost thing then. Uh, the school that we started with for preschool was very expensive as it went on. So, for example, I think now year 12 is, is about $30,000, which is completely cost prohibitive for most people, let alone Aboriginal families. Mm. So we swapped to a different one and it was great until we experienced racism in the school. Again, they hadn't had an Aboriginal family in the school. Um, so the racism, the principal was not unhearing and we had had a beautiful journey as far as bringing things to the space and done some amazing things. Um, and we referred to it then as building a shared space of understanding because our family had joined the community. The community had little or no um, contact previously with Aboriginal mm -hmm. people. Many, many people said, you're the first Aboriginal people we've ever met. And so we did work with the, with the space a lot on what we termed building a shared space until we struck a wall where racism aired its head and we were organising a culture camp for the kids and one of the mothers said to me, before we talk about, you know, what we're going to feed the kids, I'd just like to say um, we all know that Aboriginal men have a problem with pedophilia. Mm -hmm. And so that was our exit out of that school. The school as a, the principal as a leader had never experienced anything like it. Her skill set didn't allow her to deal with it. Mm. She basically burst into tears and said, I'm so sorry for what's happened to you, but I, I don't know what to do. I don't, I don't have the, what my toolkit that tells me, you know, how to deal with this. So we were like, oh. so um, we did think we'll give this Steiner education for the younger children one last attempt. And so we moved to the Central Coast um, where there was another Steiner school. And we were attracted to that Steiner school because um, I hadn't given up on Steiner education as a teacher, mm -hmm. but um, we were attracted to that one because there was already 15 Aboriginal children in the school. Um, so we thought, oh. We found our space. We found our little place. Mm -hmm. Sadly, though, um, new principal came in shortly afterwards, and consequently, there are no there are no Aboriginal children in the school anymore. Yeah. So we found that leadership is a huge thing mm -hmm. um, in all schools. Mm -hmm. So that's our most recent experience. We've had similar experiences in public education, mm -hmm. in the private sector. Mm -hmm. and where some of our children have sought scholarships <coughs> to academic schools. Mm -hmm. So that also manifested in this compounding um, sort of what we were told was a problem because one principal actually said to me over the years, it's, it's really out of my way of um, dealing with Aboriginal people because I've never dealt with an intelligent Aboriginal child. Oh, goodness. <laughs> so the assumption by leadership is that if they, God forbid, they take on an Aboriginal child or an Aboriginal family into their space, they have this preconceived notion that they're going to be labouring with all of these uh, stereotyped uh, socioeconomic um, uh, values that are sold to be Aboriginal. I think the systemic nature that all of the systems that we've experienced really, um, and I suppose most people would say that Steiner education is very marginalised, which I'd agree with. I also would agree as an Aboriginal person that it does have a conservative nature about it that has a tendency <laughs> to be actually, <laughs> actually um, 
That's that's Minya. Oh, that's Minya. I can't see. <clears throat> she was curious. She so, how come we can? They're on our computer now. We always see them on the other TV, and now they're on our computer. We're talking to them. That's right. Man. Just an aside, Yindi would love to. Um, we showed him the um, handle making video that you did just recently. Yindi's like in awe. <laughs> He's like, oh, can yeah. I meet Woody? Oh, yeah, no, yes, please. Anytime. <laughs> After Victoria comes out of lockdown. <laughs> Oh, we, we just might have to go down that way for a drive one day. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. So I think really what we've experienced was this, this vacuum <clears throat> where there's so many preconceived notions of what you come uh, from mm. a non-Aboriginal perspective, what people expect. Well, I guess we think about, you know, going back to, you know, our experiences, even, you know, for example, Aboriginal studies, you know, um, and, you know, the work that we've done, you know, for a long time in the, uh, you know, the early and late 80s, you know, creating with the, uh, the public system Aboriginal perspectives and Aboriginal studies in schools. And, of course, you know, the, the importance of that. But, of course, you know, for us, you know, we know that, you know, there are a lot of, uh, un unless the teacher is really committed, unless the school is committed, then, you know, there's no real effort in applying Aboriginal perspectives or uh, or studies, so it makes it really difficult. And, and as Aboriginal parents, trying to share that sort of understanding with you know people who really, unfortunately, sometimes just don't have a clue, mm -hmm. and, and you know uh, you know or or just really don't want to uh, you know to understand that. But there seems like a lot of parallels to what was raised recently in In My Blood It Runs, um, the film that uh, mm. came out a little while ago. Have you seen that? Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. But a, a completely different cultural and community context, but it, mm. a very, very similar issues, particularly, um, yeah, lack of leadership that, that you're talking mm. about, that, that was so evident in the white schools or the white run schools um, in, in mm. My Blood It Runs. Yes. Yeah. yeah. You know, I, I guess our decision in terms of taking kids out of the school and uh, practicing, you know, homeschooling, of which you know Jen um, does that. I still work, so you know, travel a you know an hour and a half on the train every day to to Sydney and then then home again. So you know, it's three hours in the uh, the day that's gone just in travelling for me. Um, and then of course, you know, my role uh, sometimes takes me you know, all over the state and sometimes across the country. Um, so, you know, all of the other uh, homeschooling is uh, Jen's baby, I suppose, in terms of, you know, um, how she might, you know, um, uh, provide what Thank our, uh, yeah. <laughs> and this is Frankie. This is Frankie. <laughs> Day, Frank. Frank, Frankie's got a little baby sister that she hasn't seen yet. Yeah, she hasn't seen her little sister yet. <laughs> and you can say hello. Hi. Hi. Say hello to Megan Patrick. <laughs> say hi. I hi. think hi. I think if I was honest, I'd say too that it was probably me that held on to schooling for too long, retrospectively. Having he, my career I changed from careers a few times before we had our last four children really late, like we're very old parents with these last four. But um, so I had I started in agriculture and I would started with Bill Mollison at Hawkesbury Ag College um, and James Wilson, who Jim Wilson, who was a biodynamic uh, dairy farmer and teacher. And so... That I did my first degree at Sydney Uni in agriculture and then I went to Hawkesbury and did this systems approach to agriculture and it was in the really early 80s um, that I did that and it gave me a sense of interconnectedness that everything is, is like a, a segment of a, of a web, of Charlotte's web. And from there I, I uh, worked in ag regenerative agriculture and other you know amazing things that you were able to travel with with these amazing people like Bill and others and then I went into um, teaching and 
I was actually told by a principal, you really, you're really not a teacher in the way we have to abide by all of these rules. You're just that guide that stands in the background and lets things happen and, you know, and I sort of, I'll never forget that conversation. And then I was working at a one teacher school and all of the nine children um, were all off um, two or three remote stations and we had a ball and I actually said to the kids one day, you know, like, because their, their real teacher was on maternity leave. I said, oh, you know, she's going to be back next term. And they all went, oh, but you'll, you'll still be here. And I was like, no, no, we'll swap back. And what came out of that, I realised that the space that I was working in was, I, I just couldn't do it anymore. It was, yeah. it was having to tick boxes and having to turn pages and having to feel as though um, you had to fill an exercise book of beautiful constructed work but you weren't actually working with the whole child and therefore you weren't working with the community and the space that you were building in your classroom. So I did some retraining and became a Steiner teacher and that was great. Um, so I think it was me that held on to this, well, I'd taken this big step then I'd taken this other step and I did law and then I was even able to sort of like see the white man's law and the black man's law and then the total injustices. And then I think that the, the castle started to crumble. Once I realised how, how unjust the, the entire ways of engagement with Aboriginal people is, um, I think we just survived it until that point and we've been really busy and had, you know, had a lot of children. And I think I wanted, as my as a parent, with the last four, and like I said, we had them really as much older parents, I wanted to be more consciously present of each and every footprint that they were leaving um, and breaking that down for me was a process and deconstructing learning, I think, too. I had to, I had to do that, um, which was a wonderful process. Um, and it allowed us as a family to work out our priorities, I think, too, which are too often conformed by where you send your child to school, I think. And what are those priorities? Well, now we have um, the four youngest ones um, from 18 down to nine. So in New South Wales, there's the regulatory body of homeschooling through the state governed body, yeah. I would um, I would say that I know more people who don't register uh, for homeschooling. So um, that there's those two avenues. Um, where we live on the central coast, it has the highest demographic of homeschool families in Australia. Um, I would imagine that probably 60%, roughly, maybe even more, uh, are not registered. Most people choose registration because they are uh, one of they're either a from one of the sectors of homeschooling, so Jehovah's Witness or Mormons, or so they're very much a sort of like pillar of the community in, in the homeschooling community, or people do it to seek economic support so that they continue to receive their Centrelink mm -hmm. payments if they're registered homeschoolers. Um, mm. until their last child finishes school. Um, our homeschooling day would centre around not the mention of school but us as a, as a fluid family um, where we look at like-minded things that we believe now are important to connect our children to and there'd be the lifestyle uh, type of skills, um, but I think the two most important ones, um, and lifestyle fits into these, is is their ability to find themselves and to be truly strong about their identity, mm -hmm. and to actually connect them to the space that we we are in. And so that space is fluid. Um, 
So particularly having lots of grandchildren too, and so it's it's not a day might be um, our he was then nine, our nine year old son being able to care for newborn twins for a couple of hours a day, mm -hmm. changing their nappies and you know things like that. Also, although, although they were opting out of changing nappies this morning. <laughs> <laughs> been talking about you. Um, to very connected, very connected stuff. And I think how I've how I've engaged with that, I've gone back those thirty five years to particularly um, the connected space that I had when I was studying um, systems, a systems approach to agriculture. I could really say you could rename that a systems approach to being and being being just an existing entity in a space and actually working with the space around you being um, a connectedness so mm -hmm. that everything that we do is connected to our space. So our property at home, of which recently we haven't been at very often <laughs> because of the grandkids late in the last week, but we live very differently to... Um, most of our extended family in particular um, and our children probably are more connected to the nature space as Aboriginal kids than our extended family who are very urban Aboriginal kids. And I think urban Aboriginal kids are the vast majority of Aboriginal kids in Australia and they, they feel powerless. They feel like they're, they're not heard. Um, Whereas I think our kids are learning their own self. And, for example, um, we had one of the girls, she wanted to experience TAFE just to sort of see what it was like, what it, what it offers. So our suggestion was we'll do something that, you know, you've never had any experience with. So she chose a Cert 3. She was, she's 15. This, this was this year. She's 15. And so she chose a Cert 3 in beauty, which for, for me was, you know, an absolute contrast to anything I would have selected. Yeah. But it was for her an artistic experience in, in colour and design and things like that. But for a 15-year-old, she was the, obviously the youngest in the class and she had to endure many forms of racism and she was there alone. Um, you know, the ultimate in the, the last, second last week of the course was she was actually called, called a nigger by one of her fellow classmates. And we were so proud of her, the way she, she, hand, she, she held the space with the situation. Um, probably we, we, we experienced more anger than what she did. She actually was able to to say, stop, listen, that's not right, mm. and really held the direction of how she wanted the, mm. the resolution to come out of. Mm. And I think for us we realised then, oh, what we're doing is actually the right thing. Yeah. We're allowing them the time and the space that they need to work out who they are, where, where their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, they understand them. They may almost always be a weakness, but they can rely on their strengths to balance out their own weaknesses. And I truly don't believe that if they hadn't had the time in the last, because we've been out of any school system for almost seven years, I truly don't believe that they, the outcome would have been the same for her. Mm -hmm. So, And I guess even with that, you know, I mean, that's, that's probably a, uh, a negative you know, obviously for uh, Ali's experiences, but, you know, what we tried to um, let her understand that, you know, this is this is a an institution that has rules and responsibilities, you know, duty of care for, uh, for students. Um, and, and unfortunately, you know, they'd gone not the full way to provide that duty of care. Um, you know, as an Aboriginal student, first off, they should have allowed or, uh, you know, made sure that she had contact with, you know, 
um, an Aboriginal person who works for, the, you know, for TAFE New South Wales, who would be that, you know, initial, you know, here's a person who would support you through this. So none of that was actually provided. So we're really wondering what's going on with that, even though, you know, we've worked in it for, uh, you know, uh, with TAFE and with, uh, you know, education in New South Wales, we know that the policies and procedures are there, but they've really failed to uh, to do that. So it sort of, again, gives us that, you know, sort of, well, you know, unless you actually jump up and down, um, then, you know, they sort of think, oh, well, you know, no one's going to support, you know, um, or question any of the, uh, you know, the policies that, are, that should be in place and should be, you know, enacted, then they won't do anything about it. So, you know, for, uh, that's part of the frustration, I suppose, for us as parents. Um, you know, um, on, you know, no doubt we'll, we'll have a conversation with somebody in TAFE, um, you know, in the next little while just to query what things are in place for students like, um, you know, our daughter. Uh, not, not putting the focus on her. I think she learns from that. And what we want is for her to actually have that understanding, yes, okay, it's there, they do have these policies, so I need to be aware of that. Mm -hmm. And anything like, you know, happens uh, in, in the future, if she does go back to TAFE, then she's going to be, you know, more aware of, you know, her rights, I suppose, mm -hmm. uh, whatever it might be. And it, and it doesn't necessarily have to be around the issue of racism. It's just, you know, um, students' rights to uh, uh, to be, you know, and feel safe in an environment like that. And that's all we want, really. And this, and this sort of sh culture of shame um, goes well into the heart of uh, schooling or institutions in, in Australia. Yeah. Um, and and yeah. even um, something came up for us the other day as parents, which was quite... Um, uh, uh, revealing our, our youngest Woody who's um, seven uh, went to a friend's place and was talking about um, was it the dinner table? yeah the dinner table quite openly about you know he's, he's really proud of himself he's he's been 30 days without wetting the bed and he was saying because he didn't want to have any water with dinner a friend of ours basically said you can tell he's um, unschooled, unschooled because it's hard to be so confident in themselves to, to bring up something that would be suicidal, uh, socially, su socially, um, yeah. social suicide in, in, in a school mm. environment. Um, so that's yeah, right. there's a cultural mm. blindness that's so deep. Mm. Um, Tyson Yanka Porter is an incredible sort of unpacking of, um, in his book Sand Talk, of the Prussian military the two mm. nights as a sort of foundation for um schooling is is so revealing and he you know he kind of says this is a provocation but there there's there is some very good research in that um unpacking of what we've inherited <laughs> In 1839, 13 years before the first successful school compulsion law was passed in the United States, a perpetual critic of Horace Mann's own political party, the Boston Whigs, charged that proposals to erect German-style teacher seminaries in this country were a thinly disguised attack on local and popular autonomy. The critic, Arrestus Brownson, allowed that state regulation of teaching licenses was a necessary preliminary only if school were intended to serve as a psychological control mechanism for the state and as a screen for a controlled economy. If that was the game truly afoot, said Brownson, it should be reckoned an act of treason. Where the whole tendency of education is to create obedience, Brownson said, all teachers must be pliant tools of government. Such a system of education is not inconsistent with the theory of Prussian society, but the thing is wholly inadmissible here. Most second peoples in Australia um, don't, I mean, look, and ourselves included, um, don't understand the levels of blindness, uh, particularly cultural blindness, um, mm. particularly in relation to Aboriginal communities and people. Mm. And it's, mm. it's so deep um, and so unexamined. Mm. One of the things, though, mm. I wanted to, I'm really interested in because 
while I think we've located some of the uh, the challenges um, that uh, well s some of the challenges of of just our cultural situation that we find ourselves in, and we haven't even got to COVID or um, ecological um, <laughs> crisis or anything <laughs> like that. But um, I, you know, it, you started with your experience of Steiner and as parents and, and educators. And, you know, to me, Steiner is like the last, or, or a last bastion of Christian animism before, uh, or just the last little thread. So that to me has always been of interest. Um, not that I've been a Steiner parent or um, we've had a little bit to do with Steiner education when we traveled by bike on the East Coast of Australia. We gave a couple of um, talks at Steiner schools. But yeah, just the, the for us, um, uh, indigenous knowledges um, and in, uh, Aboriginal ways of being with land and, and being in the story of land um, is what we also find um, connections with our own first people and our own first people's story. Mm. For example, um, my Druid ancestors, uh, their universities were oak, great oak forest, professors were the trees. And so this um, animus traditional multi-species regard and inter um, engagement with is, you know, is very much within all of us. We all have uh, second peoples and first peoples have well, obviously first peoples much more so in this country, but our, we're very passionate about second peoples reconnecting with um, our first people's ancestral stories and ways of being in land, because that is a way to then um, find fellowship with first peoples in Australia. That's a, a yeah. very sort of important work because as modern, as severed modern subjects of capital, um, there is almost like this unable to build relationships with Aboriginal yeah. consciousness and cosmology. Philosophy and, and ways yeah. of being. It, this is, seems to be, the, for me, the biggest stumbling block for second people yeah. in Australia. Um, and it's yeah. because we've yeah. lost our story. We've lost our own connections. Yeah. Mm. Mm. Yeah. I think, Patrick, that the, a really good example of that, that thread, is the revitalisation of Aboriginal languages. Mm. And language, um, if you look at the Sydney Basin being the first space on the continent to be so brutally invaded, there really was not only a massive destruction of the people, but their connection to the land was, was put to sleep by the cessation of their language. And how we see our, our way is that the land holds the culture and the beings of humans and animals and plants, they are just the trans, transfer agents a, a, across the land. And so the land holds the culture. And we've had a great interest in the revitalisation of language per se and how that is the connection to space or place. If you look at the uh, example in Sydney where the use of uh, European um, recordings in William Dawes' diaries and in three other primary sources, we would have to say as Aboriginal people, if that hadn't have been written down, how, how long may we have sat on country before country gave, you know, was able to rebloom language itself? My name is Kelly Saunders, um, proud Gunner girl. My family are from Stevens from down that way in East Gippsland. Um, and then we've got ties on the Ewan country where my mum was born, around Bega and Wollaga Lakes. And uh, mum was removed from there and raised on Gunnagara country. So, and that's where I was born, on Gunnagara country. Ties to there as well. And then we're Birupai on my grandfather's side uh, from around Tari, moved on to the mission at La Perouse. So um, five different languages, five kinds of dreaming stories and cultures, five ties to different sacred spaces. And it's meant that being raised without language um, has resulted in me not always having a strong cultural grounding in language um, and in connecting to community. And so poetry in first languages is my own uh, response to that. Um, 
It was born on the banks of the Shoalhaven River and I could hear the sounds of ancestors singing. I was writer in residence down there with London on Trust and Red Room Poetry. And um, I'm not sure if you've ever had that experience, hearing language, uh, but it can be a little bit off-putting. <laughs> so I called my auntie, Auntie Trish, I can hear these voices. And she said, oh, good, what are they saying? I said, good, uh, this is really terrifying. You know, I, I don't know what they're saying. And she said, well, that's what they're saying. It's time to go and learn language. And so uh, I met with our artistic director at Red Room Poetry, Dr. Tamron Bennett, and said, Tamron, I'd love for me to be able to learn language as a poet, to write poems in language. I'd love to support elders to teach poets um, their own languages to be grounded on country and uh, for us to help kids to do the same and she said well you dream up the project and we'll deliver it and in the last year two years uh, we've delivered probably closer to 45 or 50 workshops um, on Aranda country, Gunungara country, Gumia Darawal, Darawal um, and Gadigal nations as well and poems have been published by poets in uh, Pintupi, um, Japu, Banjalang, Nonawal, um, we've also led workshops on Nonawal country, Gunagara, Gumia Darawal Gun and uh, Darawal language as well and we've focused on students writing poems on country with their elders community um, in response to different conservation ideas as well. So in in the process of revitalization have we have we actually sped up that process? I don't believe it would have ever died in the in the non-Aboriginal way of death. Um, but it's very interesting when you talk about language revitalisation and language speakers, how that in itself is dividing Aboriginal people. And it divides Aboriginal people in many ways. It divides them from there are those of us who can still remember the days when you were not allowed to speak any language that you knew. Um, those of us that can remember the, the language of listening to the older people when we were children mm. and knowing knowing some of this, the old sayings and hearing that in a, in a common space. But if you made the mistake of then taking that to school or to the park or to a, your friend's place, that, that was a huge stigma mm. uh, placed on that. And now in Sydney, it's almost like there's there is a there's a movement of support from non-Aboriginal people about language revitalisation, mm. but the government has now got in there and is funding you know one million dollars a piece for a small package program again with outcomes based deliverables mm. where they want to now steer the way in which Aboriginal languages are being revived, mm. and so you're going to have this massive White, white white way of how it's perceived revitalization should occur so i think what what you described mm. was such a classic example of that being so so conformed and yet the the spiral still trying to pull a little bit in the other in the in the other direction by really beautiful hearted people who want to connect at a different in a different way and and be supportive and really want to hear and listen and be part, be, be then sort of like brought mm. to the same space and share that space or place. Um, but government always has to come in with its conformed way and it's a monetary way of dealing with what's seemed as a problem. Mm. But how can we make the problem, in other words, how can we take it over, making it still look as though there's ownership? Yeah. But it's, yeah, mm. it's, it's really... And I think that's the classic example at the moment. Yeah. It, it was happening 30 years ago with art, particularly central desert art mm -hmm. and the exploitation of, of art, which still goes on today. Yeah. And then mm. lang language has been the next thing. And although I think art is art as in the, name, the namesake art, but for Aboriginal people the, the notion of art is very much of uh, connecting to space and leaving like a footprint on country, okay. but it connects, it's a reciprocating connection. And for example, we take um, the kids to a massive rock engraving um, location in the Karingai National Park north of Sydney. Mm -hmm. um, it's not very well known by many people, but it's about the size of a big football ground, wouldn't it? Probably. Oh, the length of it. The it's length probably, of it. You know, 80, 90 metres in length um, with you know, numerous um, uh, carvings and, and some very, very significant, mm. um, you know, emu in the sky, for example. Yeah. 
And of course, you know, that's part of that, you know, obviously for us and part of my work with uh, New South Wales Health is we, we designed um, what we call Respecting the Difference. It's our cultural training for all New South Wales Health. And we um, deliver that in, you know, online and face-to-face programs. So it's about, it's, it's, it's meant to not only make people aware, but, you know, talk about the issues that impact on Aboriginal people from a health perspective. Uh, and talking about the uh, the history, you know, for example, hospitals, you know, 50, 60 years ago still had segregated uh, areas. We know that, you know, but, you know, most people who are coming into the health system working as a nurse or a doctor don't know that. Mm-hmm. So, you know, when you, when you start talking about that history, then, you know, for them, you know, that couldn't have happened. Well, you know, um, yes, it did. You know, many people come into, you know, a workplace like New South Wales Health and we employ, you know, 150,000 people, um, you know, as as doctors. And then, of course, you know, that doesn't mean anything to them. Uh, and then when we start talking about, you know, the, you know, well, you know, if, you're, if you are a doctor, there's every chance that you will actually provide a service to Aboriginal people, mm. whether you know it or not, you know, depending on, you know, the visual aspect of uh, uh, that they want to uh, take take and most most of the time they it's usually you know well unless they you know fit the stereotyped mould of an Aboriginal person you know dark flat nose you know all of those uh, characteristics then you know they couldn't possibly be an Aboriginal person so you know they they totally miss out on that you know. Um, Aboriginal people with fair skin, with red red hair, blue eyes, and all of those things. We, we usually say there's the saying amongst Aboriginal people: you you know that they're black when they open their mouth, and it's usually the way that they talk. So it's you know it could be Aboriginal English, and that's a an important dialect, if you like, within Aboriginal communities. And that goes back to the issues of of when people were removed from communities and put on what we call today missions, and of course all of their rights of language, um, connection to country, you know, the hunting, those sorts of things were taken away from them. Then you know that was basically lost. But people, you know, chose not to use language or the hunting, you know, because of you know those rules that were put in place. And of course today, you know, um, you know, when you're talking about Aboriginal English, you know, when we've been saying for for many years in the education system um, it's a it's something that you have to be aware of because that's what kids bring to school from their home they have that you know language that is mixed with you know english and with words that have been passed down for you know generations and they use that every day so the education system needs to recognize that and we you know work through that quite a quite a few years ago, but if I was to, you know, go to a school today and uh, and ask, you know, 50% of the uh, teaching staff, what do you know about Aboriginal English? What do you think they would say? I'd say, what's that? Probably absolutely nothing. Mm. What's that? Mm. You know, so there's always those challenges in terms of how do you, mm. you know, um, bring something like that to the table and have someone understand it, you know. Um, we've had the luxury of working the education system to try and bring that about. And, and of course, there are a lot of people now still, you know, continuing the battle, you know. There's still another, uh, you know, saying sometimes when you're around, you're talking about something and 10 years on or 20 years on, you're saying, well, actually, we were talking about that 10 years ago or 20 years ago. It, it hasn't changed. Mm-hmm. Um, which is, you know, frustrating for us and uh, frustrating for, for many others. Mm. I think. Just back to the rock engraving site, mm. we, an example for our children, um, and I think it's, it's about their Aboriginal, um, it's about their identity, and, but it's about, about them, just their, their, their way of being an Aboriginal child. Mm. When we go to a site like that, they have an innate non-directed, non, non-enforced non way of being on the site. 
they have it's so interesting to yeah. watch them they even as little really little people put them down shoes are off and they will innately just explore as if they're being guided by the the ancestors before them they will be steered by some non-visual power they don't tread on the engravings they immediately are immersed into the space in a spiritual way where that the one I'm talking about has a, a men's side and a women's side mm -hmm. and we've watched our children in just by being in the space they actually without instruction the boys will do one thing the girls will do the other whereas I've taken groups of non-aboriginal kids there mm. and there's there's no connection there's no everything has to be an enforcement way of how you're going to behave and mm. I think when you describe the Patrick the the difficulties of bringing bringing that together I that's a classic example for us mm. is our children innately have it and they for hours will be there and mm. they'll they'll naturally nurture the space by removing any natural debris from the engraving and pulling away the moss and things like that you take other children there who've had like similar experiences of even being homeschooled all their lives and um, you know from families that you know are very connected to nature and things like that but there's there's something that is very much different yeah, yeah. very much different and um, we very feel very fortunate that our kids still have that in them yeah. too that it hasn't been taken away mm. by by generations of as trying to assimilate people that that it is still in them sadly many adults that you might take to sites like that too yeah. you know and there are rules around you know what you should and shouldn't do and, and quite often we talk about you know well take the shoes off because there's less uh, impact on you know sandstone and uh, and of course you know we know that you know there are cycle clubs and so on that you know um, encourage the uh, riding of bikes and motorbikes and across some of these platforms without any consideration of the damage but you know just taking people there and then going through that process of you know well if you take your shoes off then you know for Aboriginal people this is where we start to think about you know that connection to country mm. and what is important for for us through our you know feel you know as far as the uh, the food is concerned and that connection and why it's important to preserve those sites because you know sandstone does break down um and, and there's sadly as i was going to say that you know there's still too many people who really don't understand that uh these days you know we we you know wearing all sorts of uh shoes and boots that uh, can cause damage so it's trying to get that sort of, you know, understanding. And I was just going to say also one of the uh, um, things that we're currently working on at the moment. Um, next week, we I, I work in uh, in a building in St Leonard's, which is on the north north side of Sydney. And you know, we uh, in that building, there's probably around about a thousand of the Ministry of Health staff, and we've you know built a purpose. Uh, purpose-built uh, building just on the other side of the railway line so it's only 500 meters away mm -hmm. um, and we would be working in that space in terms of you know um, understanding or recognizing you know the connection the country for Aboriginal people so when they take an old buildings down and cleared the site we'd actually have a smoking ceremony mm -hmm. as part of that process mm -hmm. and of course you know the buildings now complete we're just about to move into it and uh, and of course we continue to work with uh, what we call you know properties in New South Wales who owns the building. Uh, they engage an Aboriginal artist through our consultation to do some work on the outside. But we're still talking about you know what are the things that we can do inside to make it you know keep the theme and the uh, the context of connection to country. And one of them is that you know we uh, they've got these uh, huge cement pillars. Which is in the uh, you know the the ground floor, and one of the ideas was that you know we created some narrative that would uh, 
give uh, any visitor to the, uh, to the building an understanding of connection to country. And the concept that we uh, talk to them about is, well, you know, one of the trees that is significant in this area is uh, the Angophora. What we could do is um, have the artist actually paint one of these pillars and they're just plain cement pillar um, and paint it as an Angophora. And thinking about it in terms of this tree as a symbol of the significance of the vegetation and plants in this particular area uh, around North Sydney and how that's connected to country and having the narrative actually on that. So when people read what the narrative says and then they ask, you know, well, why is it painted on this? And then we can say, well, this tree is uh, an important tree in terms of the vegetation around this particular area. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it gives another talking point and, a, and a, a very clear understanding of how people nurtured, how Aboriginal people nurtured those, um, you know, those trees and plants and the importance of it to our culture and, of course, the importance of it to uh, connecting the country. Mm -hmm. And it would make it a, a, a visual um, focal point for any visitor coming in and that building will have thousands of people coming through over the week and that's one of the things that we've said this is important for you know for aboriginal people because let's think about what happened prior to this building and all of the buildings that were put in there there were never any protocols put in place to recognize what you know sites might have been there and many of the sites would have been uh, destroyed buildings were put up so you know no no real connection or understanding about you know you know the the local uh, people who uh, nurtured and cared for that country for thousands of years. Mm. So that that project that Charles is talking about is has been like a family project for us. Mm. So yeah. the the whole two year period that it's been going on for. So our children were the. Um, the conveners of the ceremony, um, along with Charles and his brother. So Charles and Charles's family are probably the most notable uh, traditional uh, people of the Sydney Basin. And so his older brother and himself were, are the elders uh, recognised in the Sydney area. Mm. Um, so Ray, his brother, was was the the equivalent of mother country in, on the space when the old building had been taken down. And so our, our children with us and as part of what people, you know, mm. what we do on a daily basis instead of sending our children to school would be work on like these type of big projects together. And so the, the children were really involved in the setting of three fires and the collecting of the leaf matter so that probably you've, you've been to um, traditional welcome welcoming welcome to country ceremonies and to smoking, smoking ceremonies. ceremonies but we mm. wanted to actually instigate with the children because it's their their land we wanted them to take a role in in really developing something that was more than what people expect to see when they have, go to a welcome to mm. country and a smoking ceremony so we want we wanted to stretch them so it was like an artistic installation but it was also culturally pushed pushed them further than they're used to seeing as well as in relation to the the normal welcome and the normal smoking and yeah. so we with them devised you know three separate fires and we had all people five or six hundred people who were there participate in the actual ceremony and the kids actually held the space on the fires, they built the fires, they actually, you know, gave the gift of of the the leaves to people to actually commence in a in a circle the the actual smoking process. And um, I think the audience were expecting the very mainstreamed way of ceremony that has been devised around Aboriginal culture. They weren't expecting um, 
the engagement that they had with the experience. Mm. So they didn't. Ex they expected to be spectators of what they perceive is 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 the tradition, yeah. and what they got was well, actually no, you're going to actually be part of this if you want to really connect. So we found mm. that. It was a combination over two years that the children and us mm. as a family have done it and now what Charles is referring mm. to, the writing of the narrative. Mm. So there's always mm. been these real big stumbling blocks with government and with officials and but mm. the children were able to actually have this two-year yeah. process mm. to see and then obviously from these fires that we had two years ago, the, the ash from the three separate fires will be embedded into the gardens around around but the kids have had a real instrumental approach to that and we we spend a lot of time on the on the rock platform with them during that process and so they their little feet were walking country and just just like os, osmosis they just being in the space um, actually gave them all of these the, this almost like one of a better, better word magic Mm. into them that allowed them to be the really non-prescribed or non-descriptive ways of having mm. having to inv involve themselves in this mm. project. And it was being really good. And my Minya, our youngest, she would have been only six when she started. Mm. And she was, you know, confident and um, empowered enough at six to be able to hold the space on one of the fires and actually gift to people and extend them, um, you know, to participate and things like that. And I think for us as um, mm. family educators, I sort of, I don't really like the name homeschooling and I don't, I don't like we do homeschool, we do this, but as a family of learners and people who as a, a tight mm. family unit and so you, it was like a real fat, juicy thing to be able to do, you know. It was fulfilling, immersed them culturally, but gave them a sense of empowerment to to be constructive. And and mm. I can't really describe how it happens, but the innate way in which the culture comes from the land into little beings and how they just have it. Mm. And it's not instructed and it's not conformed and it's not directed. And so it's, it's like mm. a musician that picks up an instrument and just has a sense of being um, in the you know connected with it mm. and that for us is the highlight of where we've come to now with the children I think mm. I, I and really, involving them in that. I really like that use um, I think that's the best term I've heard um, family educators or fa family mm. educated mm. because yeah homeschooling mm. and unschooling these aren't terms that quite fit the um, I mm. mean a community uh, Community schooling is another term we often use, but then it, it sort of alludes to um, uh, something that's being community established rather than just um, a more mm. informal uh, and specific projects. But one of the things I guess mm. I, I can really understand as um, a, a family educator is just what a project like you've just described of the ceremony, just and the... Um, mm. It, it's immeasurable, mm. certainly from government or in the institutional perspective, immeasurable mm. what sort of um, development and learning and growth uh, within the family, mm. but mm. specifically we're talking about children learning, just it's, yeah, just how that sort of, um, those sorts of ways of learning have almost no status in Australia. Mm. And, uh, and yet... Um, That's right. And yet, they th this seems to be so integral to um, addressing the meaning crisis that we have um, mm. as, in a in, in a um, in a culture of, of domination for both um, Aboriginal and Second Peoples uh, in Australia. Like, what are some of the kind of key points you've learnt in the last 35, 40 years? What, yeah. what educational transformation would you like to see in t and specifically related to connection to country? Mm. Well, for me, I think, Patrick, you know, um, embedding, uh, you know, Aboriginal stories within, you know, all curriculum, yeah. you know. And, and the story is, 
more than just a story. It's it's you know it's that the story encompasses you know our history. It encompasses you know um, all of the important issues that impact on on Aboriginal people. You know, and and of course, how do we change that? You know, into the future. And like I was talking about, you know, um, many people who come into New South Wales Health not even knowing that history. If if they don't have uh, an, an understanding of Aboriginal people working at, and coming into this organisation, why would we employ them? Because at some time in their career, they're going to work with Aboriginal people. Yeah. So it's just like you know, you're learning a trade, then you can't complete your job unless you know everything about what that trade you know needs to apply. Mm. And uh, you know, if you're missing a couple of tools here, then how can you do the job effectively? So, you know, those are the sorts of things that I would like to think, you know, would be really important from a learning perspective. Mm. But again, it's, it really comes from that learner. You know, how often do we say, you know, uh, quite a lot of things are discussed around the kitchen table. Mm. And if it's negative things, kids hear that and they grow up with that. Mm. And, uh, you know, um, and then, you know, so it, it's a whole change for everyone. Um, you know, the education system has to change, the, you know, um, organisations or agencies like health and, and others, you know, because most of the time they've, they've got to apply their work to Aboriginal people. Uh, that's probably a wrong work, way to uh, put it, applying it to Aboriginal people mm -hmm. rather than, you know, um, you know, with Aboriginal people. So, you know, there's a whole range of things and I suppose we could have this conversation, you know, for the rest of the weekend, I suppose. Um, Just getting started. We'll have to revisit it another time, I'm sure. <laughs> what, what about you? Um, I think so much of it stems from the forced removal of so many things for Aboriginal people. So many things need to be given back in a truthful mindset. Mm. So when the mindset of all is about truth being at the forefront, I think change has an opportunity. I'm not saying it'll be evident, but mm. it's got a better opportunity of being sustainable when we hold truth. And I think for me an example of taking that back would be giving mm. back to Aboriginal families mm. their, their rights in relation to birthing. For example, as far as we know, we are the only Aboriginal parents in many, many years who have home birthed their children. With that came so much, so much negativity mm. from this a huge circle around us. Not our immediate families, well, they struggle too, to understand why, particularly Charles's family, well, well, why now that the health sector's not there, why, why would you want to birth your babies on country? But I really believe that until we take that back and we birth on country so that our, our unit that we're building, mm. what we are continuing as evolving culture, is actually healthy and ends well. Mm. Because I don't believe in many places the culture is well, the culture's sick. It's not dying, but it's sick. Mm. If we start taking back the smallest of things at a micro level, mm. but in order to do that, what we know or term service providers, they have to take many, many steps back and they have to, with change, accept that what they will be gaining is instrumentally far more important than what they perceive they're going to mm. lose, and that's control. So I think it starts with basic things like like that, where trusting Aboriginal people to be themselves needs mm. to be at the forefront for Aboriginal parents to make the true choices for their children. Mm. And I think for for us personally, that comes from with birthing on country. It comes with, like, ironically, Aboriginal children have the highest immunisation rate in Australia. And that's because it's government funded. If you tick the box when your child is born, 
and you register your child that they're Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander, they actually get their immunisations completely for free. But as an added bonus, they get four more than the white child that plays next to them on a swing. So looking at those things that are, are so forced upon Aboriginal people, we found as parents trying to actually maintain a what we see as a much healthier connection to country and to our mother, which is Earth, and avoiding conformity and overconsumption, materialism, immunisation, and things like that, it's so forced upon forced upon you as an Aboriginal person. You, as an Aboriginal person, yeah. you are supposed to be so thankful that um, all the, you know, charitable things and government want to look after you because they know what's what's yeah. best for you. Um, so if we we actually have even micro pockets of people who can who can be supported. At a, yeah. at a local, um, very local micro space to re-establish the way that true connection for them as Aboriginal people starts. And that comes from yeah. their, from birth and the new generation bringing back the practices of connecting to a space. Yeah. And we, we know our own family, extended family, even having this conversation now for some of them would be way beyond um, them being able to they'd see it as a process of they'd mm. have to let go of too much that they've that they've they've fought to gain whereas our perspective is some of these gains are at the, have been the real detrimental tools of the demise of of Aboriginal people's empowerment mm. to actually be free willed and free of thought Mm. But then it doesn't actually give people the strength to demand truth. And I think mm. the whole aspect of truth in, in, a, in, a, in a setting of learning, whether that be, you know, anything you engage in in life, not necessarily in a structured educational context, but that sense of learning has to actually be by osmosis. It has to be a natural way mm. that, that comes. Um, and I just see that until that's comes back mm. um, and we've experienced it and we we know that it the wonderful benefits that it's given us as a family For example going back to that um, ceremony with the fires mm. one of the fellas there and he's a lovely guy but he's a very very senior uh, government um, worker very high up public servant he came over and he, he he thanked me beautifully and said how wonderful my children were and said, oh, it's, you know, it's, I really appreciate that you took them out of school for the day so that they could be here. So there was this assumption about school, assumption that it just magically happened in one day. So there was no understanding of how the connectedness builds, builds and evolves and, and creates. And when I said, oh, actually, they don't go to school, and he looked at me and said, what do you mean they don't go to school? I said, well, we chose many years ago to cease, you know, um, sending our children away and, and chose fam being as a family as to be able to do things like this with our children. The next thing I got was, so how do you fit in all the reading and the maths and all these other things that you have to do? <laughs> you have to do. How many children did you say you have like this? And <laughs> Who gets that, who gets that all the time? How do you how do you grow your own food and do all this stuff and, and you know, sit down to you know several hours of formal? It's like I got to say this. And then I said to him in response to the how how do you fit all of that extra you know the important stuff in to be able to do this extra thing as opposed to the the his his perception of extra is is us and what we are, and so I said to him. Well, my children might not be able to tell you what day of the week it is, but they just taught you something that you would have never learned if you hadn't have been here today. <laughs> <laughs> and you would never have learned at school. <laughs> yeah. You see, bir birthing on country is, you know, fundamentally important for Aboriginal people. Mm -hmm. And that right's been taken away. Across New South Wales, you know, people who live in 
you know, those remote and isolated areas um, have to travel to, you know, long distances to, to get to a hospital and quite often, you know, um, one or two weeks prior to the, you know, baby, uh, you know, birth uh, date. Uh, and then, of course, you know, could possibly stay a week or two, you know, after that. So there's that total separation from family and community. Um, and of course, you know, today, you know, during COVID, then, you know, there are lots of restrictions around that. So when we think about, you know, our experiences of, you know, home birth, um, when you think about that, uh, Myra was, you know, uh, born at home. She's, she, she's 30. She's 30. Yeah. She got to experience Molly being born. Um, both her and Molly experienced Dahlia being born and they were all experienced Yendi being born and again Minya. We were all at home, you know, and the next morning the grandparents were there and, you know, everyone else came to the house. So you don't get that the same visitation rights at a hospital. So, you know, our choice to, you know, to do that and have family around and it's a celebration for us, you know, and you can't do that in a, in a setting. Even though I work for New South Wales Health, I know it only too well. You just can't do things like that. And we have, you know, we have lots and lots of conversations about taking the right of, you know, the woman and the family away in terms of, you know, being able to birth on country, but being able to birth at home and in a, a relaxed and safe environment. And, you know, if you've got good midwives, then it makes it really, really safe. And, of course, you know, uh, everyone's involved in it. So it's a whole family thing, it's not just, you know. I think it builds, mm. it, 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 it gives a solid foundation for what, mm. what, what people need to start their birthed experience of connection. So the whole segregation to that process, that natural inherent process that for thousands of generations held the culture together mm. is in some ways deliberately denied. I mean, Charles um, was born, his mum not birthing at home, but as, a, as an urban woman, Aboriginal woman in Sydney, but she caught the tram from La Perouse in labour into the city, went to Crown Street Women's Hospital, but was then told, well, blacks are on the veranda, so you give birth as a black woman on the veranda without any assistance. So, but if she'd stayed at home, he would have been taken off her by, by the um, authorities. So she does the conformed right thing and goes to the hospital and has... As her baby, like the good white ladies um, do. But, but she was also uh, married, which but, made a difference yeah. too because, you know, um, Crown Street Women's Hospital is a, you know, it was a, um, you know, a hospital where used young to, women, single, their babies. their babies were taken away from them. Mm. Quite often told, you know, oh, well, they didn't survive. So, I mean, that's, that's our generation. Um, mm. And so we felt taking back what we know we would naturally be able to do if we would mm. if we held our strength and space as a as a unit we would be able we would it would naturally come back and i know that that's a big perceived leap of faith mm. for a lot of people but i think we do that every day now with the children we yeah. we we go with instinct and we go with what feels right for us and for them mm. and the amazing amazing experiences that can be availed by just being together mm. you know um they, they're not suffering socially they're not suffering academically they're no. strong they're healthy they're resilient and i think, I think building resilience is is so, so important yep. and from that initial birthing on country that's a sign of resilience mm. in my mind mm. a of things yeah. that mentioned in the last few minutes, the emphasis on um, truth telling, and also the problem mm. of uh, the problem of um, the perception of uh, you know goodness in a, in a moral sense, and 
when I when I went through my initiation, one of the initiating organizers said, "This rite of passage is not about making good men; it is about making truthful men." And just mm. I think that seems to underlie, or the the you know that the wisdom in that is what is missing in the dominant cultural space, that there is a lot of pretensions to being good and so-called doing the right thing or being perceived to do the right thing, and there's very little attention paid to truth-telling. I don't think my own um, cultural um, education or experience um, has protocols or ceremonies or rituals around truth-telling. Like we don't know mm. who that is. We ha we're very good at looking good, um, but we're not very good at um, being truthful. And and I think mm. this is this is so much work that non-Aboriginal uh, people in Australia have to do. Um, and I feel yeah. very. I mean, we feel as a household very uh, obligated, and it feels like a very big responsibility for us to. Mm. Share, share in that work. Mm. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean that's right. I mean the whole. It's. I think you can avoid truth in content, and I think that's what's happened in the in in education sectors per se, from early learning settings through to secondary and tertiary settings, where you can present a con. You can present content, and you can regurgitate mm. things. But unless you actually push to the zone of truth where you talk about the view from the shore instead of the view from the ship. So the, the perspective of those that were impacted comes first, mm. not the viewpoint of mm. the invader. And I think until we can actually talk without, in conversation, in open conversation, without people feeling uneasy about that, mm we still got a long way to go, very, very long way to go. Because I think when you speak truth, you hear truth. Mm. And I think a lot of people are not practised at, at the speaking of truth, mm. the avoidance of, avoidance of certain things, the false, falsehood of it, manipulation of things, um, and even, you know, simple things like mm. filling out a form, a government form, you know, you, you're sort of always faced with, well, if I tick that box, what does it actually mean? So we're always, as a society, being put into those situations where, well, one, is it anyone's business? What, sh what impact should these questions have on me? Mm. And, and how, how does truth and the speaking of truth actually come into play with our everyday lives? Mm. I know for ourselves, we, we constantly, well, we quite often, I should say, feel mm. fearful of exposing ourselves about home birthing, immunisation, uh, mm. being Aboriginal um, and having our children taken. You know, we, we know so many people who, who would say, Aboriginal people who would say to us, do not disclose anything of those, those things to anybody because you'll have your kids taken. And, it's a, and so truth in a way gives fear. As well, mm. because we haven't we haven't got this platform mm. of giving and receiving truth. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. So I just also wanted to clarify. So your four youngest kids have they ever been to school? Um, the two the two 18, 18 and now sixteen yes, but only Steiner education, and the two youngest no. So now they are eleven and nine, and they've never been at school. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and I also, before when you were talking about language revitalisation, just how that, how you work towards that or how that plays out in your homeschooling, family educating. First and foremost, all of our children have Aboriginal names mm -hmm. and they know why the name was given to them and they know the meaning of the name. So our son, mm. his name is Yindi Wandara and that means son as in S-U-N, warrior. So he has carried that as, um, as a learning comprehensive uh, thing all his life. Um, so it yeah. starts with that. We immerse them in mm. not just languages 
per se. Neither of us are, are language speakers, but we like to have the connection to language in various mm. formats, whether it be artistic, whether it be the hearing of Aboriginal language by people, but knowing the processes too of how language was denied people, we've embedded that into them as well because, I, again, mm. I think it comes back to truth-telling. Mm. If they get to adulthood and they haven't had, as even as Aboriginal people, they haven't had the truth told to them about the status of language in Australia, Mm. It makes it makes them it makes it very difficult for them. When we were working in education, we we went to New Zealand and toured a lot of schools in New Zealand. And one we went to actually, it was a community school. And as an enrolling parent, you had an option of what you where your and it was only a small school, about 400 children from all age groups. But you decided whether you wanted your child to. Um, in that space just speak English, whether you wanted your child to be bilingual or whether you mm. wanted your child to only use Maori. And that was an option for non-Maori people. Right. And we, we just thought that that mm. was amazing. Right. Whereas Australia is so mm. antiquated that the last uh, state or territory in Australia that used to um, allow the use of Aboriginal language in schools, which was the Northern Territory, ceased that with the Northern Territory intervention. Part the like the intervention is just this manifesto of no longer able to do this. And that one of those things was the teaching of language mm. in schools. So you've got you've got schools in the territory and in Western Australia where some of those children would come into the setting as preschoolers and they would know five languages. English being their sixth language. Mm. And yet once they hit this the conform setting they might be lucky if they're allowed to have language lessons in their own language mm. um, for half, no more than half an hour a day. Mm. And you can imagine these little people, you know, they come, they come confident little beings able to communicate, know where they belong, and they come into a setting and all of a sudden, oh, well, that's not as important as we'll mm. teach you how to speak English properly and we'll teach you how you know how to read a book and and those spaces can't mm. can't do that anymore so they have these amazing mm. aboriginal education assistants in the schools who are fluent la language speakers and yet they're not allowed to speak with the students in their own language on their own country in mm. the educational setting they have to speak english because they're at school mm. and they they're those communities that actually have language intact mm. so if unless that that is able to change like this wonderful school we went to in New Zealand it was absolutely amazing to go into a classroom where children and families were deciding how they were going to communicate with each other and so you had as many non-Maori families mm. choosing that in the school setting they valued they actually valued Maori culture enough to think that their non-Maori child should actually spend six hours a day speaking Maori. I mean, look, you know, recently, because of uh, COVID, obviously, you know, I've been working from home since, uh, you know, mid-March, and the majority of our branch who are, you know, there's around about 40 or so. So every week we've had, you know, what we call, you know, staff huddles. So we're all online. Um, very early in it, we'd recognise because it's usually, you know, oh, Charles, can you do acknowledgement of country? And we decided, yeah, I could do that or welcome, that's fine. However, you know, everyone just listens. So what we decided to do was um, at least two of our staff at every hu uh, staff huddle would, would uh, acknowledge country and how they might do that. And obviously we asked them to do, you know, think about where you are, what country you're on, where you're working at that time or where you're living. And it could be that, you know, you might even want to recognise where you grew up. So, you know, that's fine. But as long as it's a process or a practice of understanding and learning what that actually means in terms of, you know, um, connecting to country. It's been a really good exercise because, you know, all of the staff who've been involved said, 
I've learnt so much more, not only listening to others about where they're actually living and what they found out about that country, but I've found out all of this about my country. You know, how on my morning walks, I, I didn't realise I was walking past sites that, you know, are significant. Um, I was e ignorant to that. But, that, you know, so it's a learning thing. We've actually, in fact, had <coughs> three... Um, uh, staff members who are from New Zealand and going back to that point in terms of what they'd learnt, they started their acknowledgement of country and they'd asked me for permission if they could actually do this. Um, can I, um, you know, start my acknowledgement of country in Maori language? And that's what they'd learnt. And, I, you know, that's fine. And... Um, you know, for us it was, you know, really appreciative too because it gave them that connection to where they actually grew up and what they learnt. So they wanted to recognise that, which was really important for them. And, of course, you know, as Jen said, the, the schools that we visited, that's what they learnt. So, you know, it was a second language and it was just, you know, um, not only the, uh, the kids learning that at school but, you know, their, their families were taking an interest in it so they were using the language that was really important. And that's one of the sad things that we find here in, in you know, New South Wales and in Australia, that that language is not taught. And then and there's a lot of discrepancies. You know, in New Zealand you're talking about, you know, maybe two or three different dialects but the same language. Uh, Australia is so much vaster than that. You know, just in New South Wales, you know, there was something like 70 you know, language groups, you know, and dialects. So it was really difficult. And, of course, you know, all of those people who were taken from country put on places like, you know, Cootamundra Girls Home or Bomaderi or, you know, and, and on missions and they weren't allowed to practise that. The language either got lost or it got confused. So, you know, people were using different words from different language groups and mixing it all together. And that caused, you know, all sorts of uh, different issues. And when we start talking about how do we introduce language in the school system, then, you know, most teachers would think, oh, well, you know, can we uh, just use the other uh, local language? Well, you know, we can, we can see over time that language was broken down because of people brought from different language groups. So it wasn't really the language of that country. And that's caused, you know, some, some real anxieties in, in how you would teach and what language you would teach. Mm. Um, and then, of course, you know, um, does the Aboriginal people of that country give permission for that language to be spoken? Mm. It's not something that can just be taken um, and there's got to be lots of agreement around how that how that might work because, you know, our experiences, particularly in Aboriginal studies, where you've got um, non-Aboriginal kids who are really high achievers and they chose it because they were really interested and, you know, um, they excelled in it. They learnt a lot more than Aboriginal kids and that, again, caused some issues in terms of, you know, um, non-Aboriginal non kids knowing all of this and wanting to know more about history and contemporary issues and so on. And it was an embarrassing thing or shaming thing for, for a lot of Aboriginal kids. Yeah. So, you know, there's a lot of, it's very, very complex mm -hmm. and there's still lots, lots of conversations that need to be had in terms of even just rules around how you might apply you know, an Aboriginal language, for example, and even Aboriginal studies. Mm. For our, for our, personally, for our children, is their naming, and then, mm. and then the open use of words, and the understanding that um, language is really fluid, but it's it's held it's held by country. Um, we recognise with the children the language of the their own mind, Wiradjuri and Charles's, but. They also mm. understand that the blending of boundaries, which we don't use as maps, we use the landscape in our stories with the children, 
um, the rivers and the mountains mm. and, as the landscape, the, the physical barriers that actually were the, the, um, the boundaries, they understand that and they understand that the crossing mm. over and through story too, they've mm. understood that um, traditionally how an Aboriginal woman would have been given, bequeathed to a, another another group which may have had a similar but mm. vaguely different dialect and in our situation they know that the adjoining language groups around the Sydney area where we've lived mm. are different and that the same word might have different meaning mm. and they also understand too the the significance of how children in uh, different parts Aboriginal children in different parts of the country um, have have been fortunate enough to still have language as their first as their mm. first language. Language gives you this um, huge, but yet starting really small context yeah. for conversation about so many things, mm. about plants, about animals, and and all sorts of things mm. that are the natural world, which is our focus for the children. Yeah. Um, and language is at the forefront of that because yeah. I think language too has no barriers, whether it be the spoken, the heard, or a lot of, of gesturing and follow, following the patterns of animals um, mm. and watching. Like was, I was pushing one of the twins on the swing just before and she was, she's only 20, they're 20 months old, and I didn't use words, I just gestured to, the, to a tree and it's a um, Queensland firewheel tree or like a Queensland waratah, I think they're called, and there was a number of rainbow lorikeets in there. So there's no words that I needed to use for her to actually be mesmerised for 10 or 15 minutes watching mm. the rainbow lorikeets um, playfully chomp, chomp away at the, mm. the beautiful, bright, red, gorgeous flowers. Mm. And I think that that's language too because it's yeah. a form of embedding in nature and I think that's really important yeah. and you don't you don't get that in school either. <laughs> and, it's, and it's also important, you know, like from we, you know, on the central coast we live on Duck and Jung country. So, you know, this, this is home for us now and I've been working, you know, from here since, uh, you know, the middle of uh, March. If we go to Sydney, you know, we, uh, you know, those landmarks that are really important, the Hawkesbury River, you know, uh, obviously Dark and Jung this side. When we get on the other side, it's uh, Gurungai, you know, and then you're going into, you know, Gumrigal country. So it's the, uh, the language that we use in terms of those, uh, uh, those countries in itself. So that's the sort of thing that we try to... So, well, you know, when we're on the other side of the uh, uh, river, we're in another country. So we travel across three countries to get to, um, you know, to my country, you know, Gadigal, which is on the uh, southern side of, uh, you know, Sydney Harbour. So it's just that sort of learning that is just comes natural and it comes through the conversation that you, you know, you're having as you're going along. Mm. Yeah. Mm. yeah, even short journeys like that. Yeah. It's just, it's been such a pleasure to get to know you um, both and, and, and some of your other family members. <laughs> and thank you. Yeah. Well, yes, it was well, next lovely. Time we'll, it was we'll, we'll introduce you to everyone else. Yeah, <laughs> lovely. I, I just think it's a wonderful thing to have conversation for others to be able to actually even people think if you can mm. hear you can think you know if you hear hear something it starts some some sort of thought process and I think that's really important yeah. and it leads to truth telling you know, yeah. you know. well yeah. thank you again yeah really great to meet you and no uh, no thank you it was, it was wonderful it was wonderful I look yeah. to meeting you in person yeah. when we can yeah that would be wonderful Good. Well, thank you for watching everyone. Um, one of the big things for me that I feel after having had this conversation with Charles and Jen is just how close I feel with the two of them. And not just from our conversation uh, in the film, but also afterwards, lots of emailing backwards and forwards. Mm. And yeah, I feel like- Collating images. And, yeah. Um, 
yeah just collaborating on this film mm. i just feel such a, a i don't know when i when i think about how i feel about them i just it's sort of this kind of feeling i just want to hug them both so tight um and hope hopefully one day we'll be able to do that yeah i can really see yeah just a deepening of the friendship and because we've kind of missed the small talk aspect and just <laughs> gone straight to the to the mm. heart of some really mm. important issues. Yeah, Charles and Jen are publishers of the of the press called Indige Readers, and they have lots of great stories written and illustrated by Indigenous Australians for Indigenous and non-Indigenous kids. And Woody's been really enjoying uh, these stories, particularly the ma more magical ones. And I think one of the the really big things for me that came out of our yarn with them was that our two families have made a lot of very similar choices in our in our life decisions mm. and not for a second has it ever come up for us that because of those decisions that we've made our children might be taken away from us yeah. and that that is still a fear in this day and age was very shocking to me. Mm. We feel like there's so much that needs to be done in every household in this country around the world in terms of decolonization and decolonizing how we live and the, the institutions that we operate in and that we support. And it is a, it is a global story. And I do feel that after having this conversation with Charles and Jen that things have opened up for us, lots of new conversations and new decisions and I guess that comes about from sharing stories and deep listening. Yeah and I think it's those of us who have the great amount of privilege that sit upon um, a few generations of histor historical privilege, sometimes several generations, to address the history and to fess up to the history. Um, and, and to teach our children a new normal, yeah. a new way of being that is much more truthful and yeah. beautiful. And while there are dedicated teachers in the formal school wing system who are doing this work, um, it's fair to say across the board uh, the work is not being done and the great majority of white institutions are not understanding or listening to the will and to the stories and to the agency of Indigenous Australians. We hope this film will spark some much needed conversations in all of our households and will give us all the giddy up to, to act in much more kind and just and responsible and accountable ways.